What's going on? Send here from ClicksGeek, and I am here with David Walter. How you doing, David? Uh, excited on a Friday uh, to be with Ed Stapleton. Uh, you, know, you got a top rank it, uh, podcast on YouTube. Uh, you reached out to me, and I was excited about it. Uh, you got my book there. <laughs> I do. I do. I appreciate it. It's the day before Memorial Day weekend, so I appreciate you carving out a little time for us today. Um, you know, I I read your book. And then I picked up the phone, I cold called you, and I said, you know, I got to get an interview with this guy, the guy that wrote this book. So um, before we dive into the book, why don't you give us a little bit of backstory about who you are, where you came from, that kind of stuff. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, that's uh, always a uh, hero journey, always has a backstory. Um, so, you know, I got started cold calling, uh, ironically, was in college. It's kind of a funny story because, um, you know, I'm kind of doing my little, uh, from Russell Brunson, you have to do your, your, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's like a, a segue journey, you know, like yep. a soap opera journey yep. story where people connect with you. And uh, my dad uh, got fired or quit his job when I was a kid uh, in HVAC and then started his own business. And from there, I was like, I want to be an entrepreneur. He was my example. He was very successful. Uh, but somehow I got, I disconnected from that. Uh, when I would grad, got out of high school, he put me in a truck with him and I was running around do, just helping him as a helper. Mm -hmm. I was belly aching. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to be just a nobody, just a helper for you and your business, you know, and belly aching all day long. Mm -hmm. And he left the job site, went to our house and kicked me out of the car and said, go to college. <laughs> Cause I was thinking I had to go to college right at that time. You know, all the brainwashing when you're in school, got to go to college, got to go to college. Yep. Yep. So I had disconnected from being an entrepreneur to, to being a, uh, one to go to college. And I sold all my uh, lawn equipment I had for years, but way back when I was a kid. I had blowers and weeders and stuff. I had stopped doing that for a while. And I had the money to go to, to uh, community college there in Plano, Texas. And it was there where uh, I met MBNA America. They were soliciting people for uh, cold calling, basically, but for credit cards to get apps. Okay. It, it's kind of a dead company got bought out by Bank of America. Mm -hmm. It was the largest uh, issuer of MasterCard. And they had like four main call centers all around the country. East Coast, West Coast, one in Plano, Texas. Well, not Plano, but Addison, Texas. But it was there where I got, um, you know, early on in sales, I had read How to Win Friends and Influence People. That really shaped me a lot. I don't know, have you read that book? I have. Great book. A lot of our audiences have read it. Uh, a lot of people judge that book, though, uh, and say, I, I have enough friends already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or they think it's about manipulation. Yep. So it's not about manipulation. It's about persuasion, right? So that shaped me. Uh, but in retail, that's in, in high school, I was in retail and was like the best retail salesman for men's suits ever. Can and, I, can uh, I interject here real quick? I want to, sure. I want to, I want you to hit on a story. Um, when we booked this interview, I, I went and did a little deep research, watched, I think three or four or five of your interviews. You tell a great story about who you targeted and why you target them in the men's store. Can you go into, uh, when someone walked in the door and you asked them a question, depending on their answer, you put them down one of two paths. Can you go through? Oh, one? sure. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. Um, that was, I really kind of shaped how to win friends and influence people. But I added on to that some things I learned early on, which is uh, that most people say they're looking, mm -hmm. right? And that we can actually connect to that if you want to. That's a really, that's about how yep. a prospect doesn't have to have a need to be a good prospect. When they come in the store, they're just, everybody, I even say it, you say it. Yep. Probably in our audience, if you go into a retail store or the mall, a salesman comes up to you and, and they say, can I help you? <laughs> Just looking. Can I, help you? What do you, can I show you anything? <laughs> Just looking. Yep. Just looking. And so obviously you're not going to make many sales. You know, people just look and they leave. And so I right on, I realized I had to, I had to, I had to do something. I had to be more proactive. And so what I would do is this Jay Riggins store had this suit sale constantly. It was constantly changing the different suits, but it was like, you buy a sport coat and you get the pants, shirt, and tie free. Cool deal, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> and so when people would say, oh, I'm just looking, I'd say, Great. That's wonderful. <laughs> I have something for you to look at back here. You know, I'd take them by the arm. And I mean, it was almost like they were just shocked at my at my response and just helpless and would just go along with me. Right. Because they didn't know what to do. Nobody <laughs> usually that pat little response got rid of the salesman. And they didn't have anything else. No right. more. <laughs> so I took them back, uh, you know, and I had, had them in the, in, the, in the sport coat. And I could size up the guys. You know, I don't know if I'm good now, but I was really good. You're a 40 jacket. You're a 42. You're a 44. Mm -hmm. You know, I could size them up and I'd, I'd kind of, boom, you know what, this one looks good on you. Before they had to say anything, 
I had a jacket on. Yep. It was on them, which is the power of visualization. That was really, really what I was into. And so I would mosey them over to the mirror and have them looking in the mirror in that sport coat. And my goal was to find out one thing. Did they have a need or were they really just looking? But what I found is my best customers really were just looking at people that had a need. When I had in that sport coat and they were looking in the mirror, they would start getting shaky and nervous. And they'd say, I just came in here for a pair of socks. Right. I'd get the sport coat off and I'd get them some socks and get them out of the store. But the guys <clears throat> that were really just looking, they would keep looking. I'd be like, look how great the suit looks on you or the sport coat. Man, think about that promotion you're going to get. You know, I didn't see a wedding ring. I'd be like, boom, the ladies are going to start coming after you. They love a man well-dressed in a well-dressed suit. You're going to have more dates than you can ever think of. You know, you're going to have that promotion. Uh, and you're going to have better self-confidence. You look, you look good. You feel good. Mm -hmm. you know, all that stuff. And I'd always have a copy of, uh, of uh, I think about GQ. And a lot of times they would mimic. Some of the designers they bought at that store would mimic some of those designs. Right. And be like, look, this jacket's right here in GQ. You're going to be fashionable as well. Anyway, um, I sold a ton. I was like the best salesman. They even gave me my, you know, that was like a part-time job. But they even gave me my own business card. I remember because I had the highest sales per, per transaction of anybody. Because I focused on the high-dollar tickets. I didn't worry about selling anything but, suit, but sport coats and suits. <laughs> The high dollar items and automatically it was four items that they bought right often i'd sell two or three pairs of pants and three ties <laughs> right right all that stuff but what it taught me was the you know rapport because i built i build rapport mm -hmm. and it taught me um the really the fundamental thing is that people don't know they have an eat you would think because just because in the store you think that they're coming there to buy something but often they're not I mean, right. a lot of people will tell me, hey, we're about to go to the movie. We thought we'd check a few stores out. Mm -hmm. So really, they were just, they weren't really shopping for anything. Mm -hmm. And when they met me, pow, they walked out with a sport coat. So people are buying on emotion, not on not on uh, logic. Exactly. Yep. exactly. Cool. So um, after after MBA in college, uh, you went to work with your dad again. Is that correct? Yeah. So, and, and you have a pretty good story about um, how you blew up his company uh, pretty pretty quickly. Go through that one for yeah, me. It ties into uh, lessons later on yep. because, um, you know, Russell Brunson says to copy success. Um, and so, you know, it was kind of when I was, when, when I was reading, I was like, hmm, copy success. I thought I want to be original. I don't know. If, and then I was like, wait a minute. My, busy, my biggest success with my dad was copying success mm -hmm. because he, I, I was out of high school at that time and was trying to help him restart as he, he, he would work for somebody and then go into his own business. He moved several places. Uh, and then he was back in his own business again. And uh, I was helping him read, you know, I was out of a job. Yep. I mean, I was out of college. So yeah, let me help my dad, you know, be successful again. And I was cold calling on businesses and stuff and talking to them but I was riding around with him one day and he was going from one install job to the next. Well, that's like $15,000, you know, a whole install job. Yep. And I was like, dad, how did you get these deals? He's like, well, I did a partnership with this new distributor house that sells all the equipment and they're really trying to get people to join their distributor. So I joined, I'm paying a little marketing fee to be a part of that. And what they did is they ran, they ran a whole, a whole page ad in the newspaper. And that's back when people read the newspaper. Yep. <laughs> you know, 25, 30 years ago, people read the newspaper. Now they don't. But anyway, basically, they imagine a full page ad and half half of the ad, the top half, yep. was just a picture of an air conditioning unit over here. And over here was a, a like a blow up, a half price sale. Air conditioner picture, you know, little the little explosions, yep. half price sale, a little, little fine print. So I said, so he was all the way down here. It was a row, row, row of, of companies all the way down here on the right at the bottom. And he sold like six to eight systems, which is, you know, that's like 34. He doesn't make all that money, obviously. Right, but he right. Good profit. And I said, dad, how much do you think the company that was first on this thing had made? And I was like, I had no idea, but probably 10 times more than we made. And I said, when this company and that company and this company, I, I said, dad, what if we were the entire bottom? What if we ran the ad? And we were the entire bottom half. In other words, we literally copied 
the whole time. Yep. Which we could because we were Bryant dealers. Yep. And then we weren't, was, you know, sometimes you don't want to actually copy exactly because right. you're not connected with the people doing it. You'll have to change it, but you look for a different picture of an air conditioner, maybe a different explosion. You know what I mean? But you yep. still, you could copy it. Bottom line is we ran that ad, got a thousand calls, more than a thousand calls from Oklahoma. We were in Texas. We got calls from Oklahoma, Arkansas. You know, everybody wanted a half price sale. And uh, we sold, I sold personally because I was doing the sales. I'd get the calls booked and I'd go out and sell the system. I had a little sales book back in the day before there were slideshows. Or before, mm-hmm. before I knew about slideshows. And, uh, you know, had pictures of the people that, you know, I got it better and better. I'd have people go out when I sold it, stand by their air conditioner, take a picture. Then I had a whole book of pictures. Look at all our happy customers, you know. I had like an 80% close ratio, which is phenomenal, and sold over a million dollars of HVAC equipment. Uh, for my dad, you know, I was only making about 10,000 a month, which is pretty good out of high school, yeah. out of BMW, <laughs> got a brand new BMW. My dad said, let's go get you a new nice car to look sharp. You're making all this money. But uh, anyway, the, it all, all the, all the music came to a stop in the nineties recession, the dot-com bubble, it popped. Yeah. And I think, I think we had oversold the market. Uh, there were a lot of different things and we couldn't find a sell. It was the winter time. We couldn't find a sell. I kept running ads because over time, you know, it wasn't just that run ad. I started running half page ads. Yep. Oh, and then, then I'd say, well, that's still working. So let me, let me run a, a smaller ad. You know, yep. I just kept making it smaller. We just kept running that ad over and over and over again. Uh, but uh, he went, he was facing bankruptcy. Uh, he ended up losing his house. Um, a lot of his equipment. It was pretty dark. You know, I don't like telling that story. It gets a little bit emotional. Yep. But I had to get a job. So I had done telemarketing in MBNA America, and that's this has only been a few years ago. And so I thought, well, I, cold calling was still hot. This is before they passed the do not call list, which you could still do B2B. Yep. B2C is a little bit tougher, but you could still do it. But B2B is pretty easy still. Uh, so I, I got a job at this company. The manager interviewed at MBNA America. So when he saw knew that I had worked there and was the top person, got hired. Now, but what they told me was they told me that I was going to be making – you know, all this money per appointment. Uh, and when the appointment held, you know, it was like 25, 25. And I was imagining, you know, making, you know, lots of these appointments every day. Right. And just, I saw dollar signs. <laughs> right. But what happens usually when you get in those jobs, it's not quite as good as what they say. Yeah. You sprint for a week and then, then the, the life gets kicked out of you and it's tough. <laughs> well, what happened is what his, uh, uh, Jerry Rizzi uh, wrote me a note about my book. But his training job, what well, you know, they had about 15, 20 people there. So a new mm-hmm. person came in and he would just have them sit with everybody and listen. That's how he trained people. Uh, probably not the best way to do it. Right. Because basically everybody there's goal was two a day. Yep. They would have made, if those, both those appointments held, that would have been about $150, $200 in commission mm-hmm. plus their, their base. Yep. They were happy with that. I, that wasn't possibly going to help me pay for my, 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 uh, payment on my car and my fancy apartment I had <laughs> left over from making all that money. Mm-hmm. So just like I had to make more money. And I tell people we've all been there dark times, you know, nobody's always successful. That's why, you know, I'm not necessarily Donald Trump supporter, but people point fingers at him and say, well, he's failed. Well, you got to fail to succeed. You know, it's, it, you're going to fail, but you're going to rise higher next time. And if you fail again, you rise higher. And you, every time you fail, you learn something that makes you go higher and higher. And eventually you can get to the point where you've learned enough where you can really avoid all the pitfalls and just kind of stream on, on, you know, on into the future, right? Right off into the sunset. Successful. Right. But you've got, you're never going to, you, if you're not failing, then you've really capped down your potential. Would you agree? Yeah. You're not trying hard enough. You're not trying. Yeah. To... You're just at that low level. You know, yep. you, just, you just only have a job and you make 40 K or something and you, you're going to do that until you retire. Yep. You're relying on other people who had all their failures and run that company. Yep. But uh, anyway, so what I had to do is I, you know, I, I asked my friends for advice. They gave me bad advice, like go get a second job. <laughs> I was literally, I usually don't go into this on podcast, but I was literally, I would leave that job, which is a full-time job mm-hmm. and go to a call center for, for another four hours. Jesus. Uh, Dial America. 12 hours in a call center a day is brutal. Yeah. Lord. I mean, I was literally falling asleep at that second job. I mean, it, this was an actual, that was a call. This one was more like white collar. Yep. 
B to B, not high pressure, that kind of thing. Right. This was high pressure. The calls were all automated. They kept coming to you one after the boom, bing, 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 bing. Um, I fell asleep. I mean, I would literally be so tired. I mean, I, I have, I've got, I had sleep apnea later on for real. Mm-hmm. But I was just overworked, and right. my head was just. Oh. Uh, mm-hmm. I only, I only did it for about three weeks, and I quit. <clears throat> and I was like, "There's got to be a better way." And I just said, I just looked at it, and I said, "You know what? It's not working harder." The potential, everybody's setting two. There's a massive potential to just set more appointments. Mm-hmm. You know, with that, you know, if they're happy making a couple hundred dollars extra every day, if I book 15 or 20 appointments a day, that would be a massive paycheck. Yep. And I could easily pay for everything I need. And I wanted to start a savings account and had some goals. I really wanted to help my family get, they were living with me in my apartment. That, that's what happened for a period of time. And I wanted to get buy land and then build a house, me build a house out in the country was my objective. Uh, but I had to make a lot more money to do that. You know what I mean? Yep. And so I said, well, you know what? If I made 15 appointments a day, I'd just make money left and right. Right. Have savings and all this crazy money. And so I picked up a book. I picked up uh, See You at the Top by Zig Ziglar. Have you read that? Mm-hmm. Okay. And so he started that whole uh, claim your qualities, uh, like uh, Stuart Smiley. Yep. I'm good enough. And gosh, got it. People like me. Right. You know, but that was making yep. fun of that movement. Yep. And today people still, they make fun of it. They think it's yep. stupid. Staring in the mirror. You know, what I would do is I, I just said, I had read Anthony Robbins, Awake the Giant Within. Yep. Uh, I had read some Brian Tracy, uh, Think and Grow Rich. But I, oddly enough, it was this book that finally got me to take action and the situation. Right. And so, you know, I'd look in the mirror every morning and I'd get passionate and say, I'm going to make 15 appointments today. And I, and I said it as if I was going to do it that day. Why that number? Why 15? Uh, I just thought it was, it was a number that seemed impossible, but not, not like totally impossible. Right. Like a hundred would have really been impossible. Right. And one day with the resources I had in the territories, I had more than one city. Yep. So I knew I could call different time zones and I could, I, I could see the potential if I increase my contacts and I've did different things of getting 15. Yep. yep. But it still seemed a little bit far fetched. Yep. So I wanted to really push because at the time what I was thinking about is I was thinking, well, if you look at human, human uh, endeavors, we always push the envelope and somebody breaks a record and then somebody else comes back and breaks that record again. And then we go further, you know, in the, the, the Russians have a satellite go around the globe. And then we went to the moon, you know, and then, you know, Somebody ran the mile this fast and somebody finally ran the mile in four minutes, you know, and then once they ran the four minutes, like, Oh crap. Now lots of people ran it in four minutes. Yep. But I mean, now fast forward to today, you just pick up social media and Facebook and it's like, they revolutionized the umbrella. They've revolutionized lawnmowers. They've revolutionized robots. Right. You know, it's like everything's better and better, constantly getting better. And I thought, so there's, it, there's gotta be a better way to do it. There's gotta be a way to make it faster. Um, I didn't know how to do it though. It, it's the subconscious mind. We talked about that Yep. Uh, in my book. And that's, I looked in the mirror every day and said, I'm going to make 15 appointments and did it every single day for six months. Six months later, I set 15 appointments. I did it. And I did it every day for six months, mm-hmm. every day for six months. That's the part. F- setting 15 a day is hard. Yep. Being consistent and doing it every day in a six month uh, hot streak. It's like Nolan Ryan pitching those no hitters. Yep. That's you're approaching mythic status yep Un- mind blowing like oh my god i can't believe it but at the time it wasn't really that big of a deal i was just trying to make money yep i didn't realize i was revolutionizing the whole concept of cold calling yep but that's what happened and this is a for you can tell me your experience with the subconscious mind but mine was i didn't know what i was doing like i just took the advice and said i'm gonna try this mm-hmm. my realization afterwards was that somehow it was like i was getting a message of what i wanted into my subconscious mind like that is somehow difficult. Right. I can't, if you've watched the secret. I uh, briefly, not the full thing. Well, it's funny because they, they talk about that delay, right? Yep. And they say that there's a good thing. There's a, a delay because imagine if we really just close our eyes and said, I want an elephant and suddenly an elephant appeared in your room. Right. right. That'd be chaos. Right. <laughs> so the universe doesn't answer our request until they know that we really, really want it over a period of time. Right. 
you've got to really, 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 really want it. And there's that big delay. Yep. And it's like, okay, now I know you want it. Right. You know, it's funny. I, uh, I, I, was, <laughs> I was listening to an interview last night in bed and the guy was talking about uh, quantum leaps and leaps in business and in life and just everything in general and how it's not how people think it is. It's never in, like the overnight success wasn't an overnight success. It was the exactly. the grind that led up to it. And it's all really just the compound effect taking, you know, actions each day and then compounding on, on each other, you know, stair-stepping, like you said, fail to step forward, fail to, uh, fail to step higher. What did you learn going from, from the, the two a day to the 15? What were some of the things you learned across um, that six month period to, oh. to that consisting 15? Well, the first, the first thing I learned was, It was really, I had to face the, you know, I had to face the reality of looking at what's possible. <clears throat> really, I had two categories. I had one, I had people who were uh, not interested. Really, I'd say there was three. And there was people that were uh, happy with what they had. Mm -hmm. I'll just write this down. And of course, there's a few people that had a need. That's the thing though, you know, a few people have a need. There's a few not interested, but right here, most people, when you do cold calling, say they're happy with what they have. Yep. Like 80% of the people you call them, they don't say they're not interested. Yep. They don't have a need. And a need is like, finding a need is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Cold yep. call. I mean, I could cold call all the lawyers in Dallas for weeks. And I might find one person that, that says, you know what, I do have a little bit of a need or something. And that's why you see such low numbers of productivity with the calling numbers. Yep. People, you know, they have cold callers doing B2B. I had one guy I was trying to help out in Austin. And he's like, I ran a call center and uh, my guy gets three to four appointments a month. <laughs> they think that's good. Yep. They think he thought that was good and I couldn't change his mind. Mm -hmm. But to the point is I had to realize, so am I going to find more people that have, am I going to get 15 appointments by finding more people that have a need? No. Probably not. No. Am I going to get someone who's adamantly not interested to set an appointment? So what's my real, my target? Yeah. Where can I make the biggest impact? If Absolutely. I'm going to get 15 appointments, it's going to be from people who say they're happy with what they have because they didn't say they're not interested. Got it. They didn't say they have a need. This was the biggest lesson. And I kind of learned that when I worked at, uh, in retail, because it was the same point. People came in, there was a few people that had a need for something and it was always a pair of socks or something small, not a big ticket item. Yep. Uh, but I could take those people if they said they were just looking or I'm happy with what I have. It's almost like just looking, right? It's almost the same thought. Yep. And convince most of those, a lot of those people to set an appointment. So that was really my big epiphany. And so, because that's the only place, that's the only option. Right. That's why my thing is cold calling is easy. It's not hard. It's hard. Think about it. Would you agree it's hard if you're going to try to find somebody with a need and that's your only possibility, right? Yep. Then it becomes it's a numbers so game. Yeah, it's a numbers game. All right. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Yep. But if you open the target up and say, hey, you can actually set an appointment with anybody who just says that they're happy with what they have, suddenly I've just made that target. I, I just said the other day, it's like playing uh, golf and we make the, the holes huge. <laughs> right. Let me ask you a question. Make the holes that. huge, then anybody can play golf. With the expanding of the, um, the qualified people, how many of those will result in a sale? Is Boom. That is a beautiful question because that's what people think. Because really what happens is you have this, the salesman or let's say the salesman's calling himself or you have an SDR and they give that rep to the salesman, right? Mm -hmm. What's a quality appointment? That's what you're talking about. Yep. Is this, is this lead qualified? No, it's not. Because what happens? What are most people brainwashed to think about? A salesman, a, a trainer, a coach, anybody like that, they're talking about sales. What is the one thing they say you should find when you're trying to talk? The to need. Someone? Pain. Yeah, a pain. need, yep. right? Well, so what are salespeople? When they look at that sheet in the comments, yep. what are they looking for? Pain. Need. Where's the pain and the need? Yep. I don't see it. This is a, I don't want that appointment. Right. <laughs> that's what we're, that's what we're battling. I wrote this book to try to change people's hearts and minds. And that was such a good question. And so you can't set a point, you can't set the appointments with people that are, that are happy with what they have. Um, 
and there's two, and I'll answer that question. There's two main reasons why you can. One is there, there's a story out of uh, the power of habit. Um, we're, we're basically Febreze. You may, you know, Febreze, we, you know, I have some, I don't know if you have people in the audience probably have Febreze successful product, but when it launched, it failed miserably. Have you heard the story? I have, only because I've watched one of your interviews, but please, please, I like the story. <laughs> right. Okay, so <laughs> so it failed because they were trying to sell Febreze to get odors out for people. You know, Ed, we we got a product to help get your odors out. Right. You know, audience, all your odors, we have a product that will get those odors out. Right. The problem is when they sent the researchers in after it failed, they realized at least there was one house where they went into the lady that had cat smells, right? When they opened the door, the cat smells overwhelmed them. They went in. She was oblivious to the smells. She had bought it. They said, you know, I got it for the cat smells. I used it one time. And then they were like, well, do you smell the cat smells now? And she said, no. So people don't know that they have smells. They can't smell their own smells because they get used to those smells. And I use that example because when you're talking about prospects that say they're happy with what they have, those prospects don't know that they have needs. They either don't know they're oblivious or in this other case, this other story um, in our, in Arkansas, I was setting an appointment and I set an appointment with a controller of a company. And, and I'll tell you another story too, but she said she was completely happy, 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 happy. But I explained like 25 years ago, there was a new way to do it called proactive, like a flat fee. And before that, everyone just paid by the hour and they waited for things to break. Right. And so this company was one of the few that I worked with that was doing proactive flat fee contain your call. So I pitched that and she was like, okay. So I got her to at least be curious, even though she said she was happy, happy, happy. And she set the appointment. Well, fast forward two months, the company met with her. They called me back and said, she's gone dark. She's ghosting us. Can you call her? So I called her, I got her back on the phone. And when I called her, she didn't remember, you know how you make those calls and people don't know quite who you are. Yep. And then you're like, well, I, I was, I was, I was the cold caller. I was calling about it from an IT company about the, and then she's like, Oh, Oh yeah. Right. She remembered. Yep. We connected. We solved that billing issue. Click. <laughs> now, how does that apply to what we're talking about? She said she was completely happy with what she had. Yep. But she made a Freudian slip. We heard what she's thinking. Yep. And what she was thinking when I talked to her is that she had a billing issue. Billing issue. Yep. Why did she set that meeting? Because she was looking for a solution for that billing issue. Exactly. Now, but was it a top of mind issue? No. Probably not because I called her. She didn't call me. Right. She wasn't out calling. Yep. Look, that's when you have top of mind issues, right? Yep. yep. So it was quote an issue, but it wasn't a top of mind issue. But it was an issue that allowed me to call and with the right approach, get an appointment. Yep. Yeah, the, oh, the hidden pain that they're not going to admit to. because There's always layers of it. Yeah. Yeah. What I find is it's interesting is you, you mentioned admit to. Because most salespeople sell to, to needs. Yep. They don't understand the psychology of humans. Humans, we, me, you, I hate to, to ask for help. I don't like for people to ask me to help them. It's a four letter word. Yeah. Ed, could I help you? Mm -hmm. Let me help you with your, with your podcasting. What does that imply? That I need help. That you need help, that you don't know what you're doing, that I'm better than you. Yep. You're lower than me. Yep. Right. That's this whole social thing. And people could be, you know, going through a divorce and uh, probably being audited to get fired and having been audited for taxes. And, And I'd say, how's it going, man? Great. (laughs) That's right. Yep. Poker face. Yep. And the only time when people lower that poker face is when they really get in drastic need, you know, somebody's sick in the family and then suddenly they'll be like, do you you know anything about it? You know, can somebody help me where we need to solve them? My my wife has cancer or once they get into dramatic, drastic need, they lower that. Right. Cause you don't care about your pride anymore. Right. You just want to solve this problem. And yep. what happens is business is the same way. They, they're prideful. Yep. They don't want to, you know, they'll often put up with problems yep. because they don't want to change. Yep. And they just keep kicking them in the face 
But that kick in the face all the time is not as bad as they think the change will be. Right. So uh, this is okay. <laughs> That's okay. Right. Um, and so that what happens is salespeople think that the only way to sell is to sell to someone who's in dramatic need and pain and desperate is right. essentially, and that's order taking. That's right. not sales, right? Yep. Yep. And so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about selling to people who say they're happy. It requires a salesman. Got it. So two, two questions. One, I want to go back. I want to close the loop on Febreze because my brain won't let me not get an answer to this. Okay. What did Febreze change that exploded the company? So what they did is they became proactive. Mm -hmm. So they, <coughs> they decided that you can't, you, since people don't know they have a smells, yep. and they would sell this as a way to prevent odors. And what's interesting is that that's often a way, because you have to change. To, to sell to someone who's happy, oftentimes there has to be a spark of something unique or different yep. to spark their curiosity. And what's ironic is oftentimes it's that proactive concept. Yep. Um, I just heard on the radio a pest control company that says they're proactive. We prevent the pest, right? Yep. Now, that's an interesting message. If you called, you know, most of the time you're going to call somebody and, and you ask them about pest control, what are they, they going to say? Do you have pests? <laughs> are you in there? What are people going to say? Well, I, I, I have a pest control company or they don't. Right. If they don't, they don't want to spend the money. Right. <laughs> they try to do it themselves, but if they have a pest control company. Right. Like, we have a pest control company. Right. Yep. So what do you do? We uh, have a guy come out there and he sprays every so often and we bill you monthly or quarterly. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what my guy does. Right. <laughs> it's, it's like, why would I need to meet with you? You know, there's no reason for a meeting. Right. But now, um, have you heard of proactive pest controls? No. What's that? Oh, <clears throat> let me tell you, let me educate you. Let me show you. I'm, you know, you're happy with that guy, but you've never heard of proactive pest control. You've never heard of proactive plumbing. You've never heard of proactive. Any service could probably be proactive. Right. Or there's other way. I, in my new book, I talk about, I actually isolate that one issue of change. And how to change in my new book, Prospecting Secrets. I'm a few months away from publishing it. But that's that's the, when they went to being proactive, they became successful. Now people go through five bottles. Yep. <laughs> right. Spraying it when they didn't go through even one bottle. Right. To find a need, to find that odor. They didn't have that odor. Right. Let's um go back to the the cold calling side of things. Um, in your book, actually, if you go to the title of your book, um, the subtitle is cold calling is not a numbers game. Can right. you talk to me about that? I mean, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the other thing. It, it goes along. Prospects don't have to have a need. Yep. Right. You can sell people that don't have a need. In fact, I didn't tell you the story about the proofs that you can sell it. You may tell you that first and then go sure. into the cold. Yeah. So the story that proves that you can sell it is uh, Tony Safion, say the systems. I helped him make a million dollars and it's listed in the book in cold calling. And I was listed at the time as his marketing director. So I had an appointment with a law firm that I set in Los Angeles. But when I called in and talked to her, she said she was completely happy. Um, she told me that she was happy like 10 times. But I was able to, I had something different, right? This idea of this flat fee was different. She'd never heard of it. Yep. Um, and so I ended up, you know, really pushing her and saying, look, let me just get Tony out there to explain this to you and prove that it's a real concept. Because I think you're skeptical. But... I know you're not going to change. <laughs> I know you're happy with what you have. Mm -hmm. And then she finally relented just on the idea of being educated about it, kind of in a distant concept, you know, like, oh, I guess I'll let Tony come out and show me how this works. But I'm not going to change. Yep. Um, and she finally set the appointment and she said, just tell Tony that we're completely happy with what we have. You, I mean, that was a completely saturated appointment with her saying she was completely happy. Yep. Right? Yep. Listen to me though, curious and set the meeting for real and knew what we, you know what I'm talking about? Yep. Yep. She knew what we were talking about. It's not a bogus appointment. Right. Right. Which is what people complain about. Yep. This was a real appointment with the, the right person. Office manager is the right person in the law firm to talk to. Um, maybe not in a construction company, but in a law firm it is. Right. So what happened is fast forward that she, she met with Tony and then Tony called me um, a few weeks later and asked me to call back on her. 
and I call back and I, I you had this thing when I do follow up. Uh, did Tony come out there? Yes. Uh, was Tony professional? Yes. Um, did Tony present what I told you on the phone? What did we, did our message line up? Yes. Um, you know, what did you think about the proposal? And then she stopped me and she said, I just have one question I have to answer. And I said, what? When I'm going to sign the contract. She switched two weeks later. She was completely, she told me she was completely happy. Right. She loved her IT guy, right? So that is, can you sell people? And I quit later on when I, I ran my cold call center for 13 years. Yep. Shut it down and I went to work for an IT company just to prove that you could sell these leads. And I sold massive amounts. Uh, I have a video where the owner told me, you know, it took a while to, to uh, like a, a six month pipeline to build it. And yep. then after six months, we just started closing three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, And it was all people that said they were happy with what they had. So you absolutely can sell them. And that's why this is profitable. But on the numbers game, the numbers game, I like to, I like to talk about a movie that we've all seen. You've probably seen as a pursuit of happiness. Yep. Okay. So if you can get that image, that cold calling scene in your mind where he says, I show up late, right? I don't have the same amount of time as everybody else. Great scene. And, uh, I don't drink water and I don't do this. And you know, I don't go to the bathroom. I don't hang the phone up because that takes time. Yep. <coughs> Uh, but he, he says he can never get to the top of the list. He's going from the bottom to the top, from the bottom to the top. So what is cold call? Cold calling or the numbers game is consecutively calling. Company A, number 10, number 11, number 12, 13, or one, two, three, four. You go through your list or it's in a CRM and you consecutively go through, you maybe have 100 leads. You go through all of them in that consecutive order. Um, you try to call 100 leads a day, right? Or 200 yep. leads a day. You consecutively go through that. And what happens is the world the world that we live in is not consecutive. It's, it's random. It's dynamic. So if you, if you imagine the, the, the companies on that list, say one, two, three, four, five, six. You just call in six companies. And I call for the CFO in this company. I call for the VP. I call for the general manager, uh, the office manager, whoever the contact is. They're not in. They're on the phone. They're in a meeting. They're out of the office. They haven't made it in yet. They're in a meeting. And you keep going down this list, right? Yep. The thing is, take this one right here. If you could, if you could have a color chart that would change when their status changed, mm -hmm. you could see on this whole list, you would see this changing from, from red, not there, Yellow, you might get them to green. And while I'm down here on this one, that was red. It changed yellow and it, it's on green now. Okay. In other words, that guy's out of the meeting. Yep. This guy just made it to the office. I'm, I just called the next number. She said he's not in. I just, when I went down and called the next one, while I was calling, this guy made it into the office. He's sitting at his desk. That guy's out of the conference room. This guy, um, whatever, he just got back from a trip. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yep. So as I keep calling down, I'll miss most people. So just to clarify that, yeah, you just nailed it there. You're going to miss most people just by the the sheer just missing people in time. They're doing yeah. different things just because they weren't there right at that moment when you called. So that that's what you're saying, correct? Uh, absolutely. Yep. And so, see, to, to book more appointments, I had to triple the number of contacts I made a day. That was the number one thing I had to do. I had to get past more gatekeepers, but mainly I just had to get, because I, then my thing is I teach people and we won't go into it, but gatekeepers are not a problem. We think there's gatekeepers and they're not. Yep. There's only a handful. There. It's like a rare thing. It's like, it's like going to the Caribbean and seeing a shark. Yep. I, I've never seen one. I've been to the Caribbean. I've been to right. Hawaii. I've never seen a shark. A yeah, person that answers there. the phone is not a gatekeeper. It's no. just the person answering the phone. Yeah. It's just call, call screener. <laughs> yep. Uh, and they're, um, they're like, it's, it's a uh, job that's low paid. Yep. And they're constantly have new people in that job. Yep. They don't know the routine. They're, they're easy to get past most of the time. Mm -hmm. But um, so the bottom line is what you have to do is what he did in that scene was he's at the bottom of the list. And he's crossing these names off, right? He's got like four crossed off 
And he just starts thinking about the top of the list like, wow, how amazing it would be to, to be at the top. And he circles Walter Ribbon's name, right? He circles that name. He calls. He gets Walter Ribbon. He ends up going to that game, remember? Yep. And he ends up meeting all these people and, and selling a ton of stuff from that call. He skipped all these calls. Now, what he did was he called out of order and at random. That's what he did. Now, the system is to do that. Is, is what you want to do is you want to call all the way up. And then you can just call all the way down. And I could call up halfway, and then I could call this guy and that guy, and then I call this guy. In other words, you'll work a list, and you'll work it kind of at a system, but also at random. Now, if I call down one list and then down another one and then go back, it's switched and switched back. That's why you want to call through 30 or 40 names and then call through those again. The bottom line is it's this. You want to call three to four times one prospect a day for up to three to four days. However, you're going to figure out how you're going to do that, right? Mm -hmm. You want to call that prospect three times today, tomorrow, and the next day. Now, you can't do that for 200 leads. Right. So you have to have a smaller group of lists that you're working. You might even have two different lists. Got like it. Two different, I'm going to call this one, and then I'm going to call that one, then I'm going to call back this one. And you just you keep going through those until you saturate them. Yep. The bottom line is, and the, the principle I usually say is, you can understand this, is like, I don't know if you have an assistant, but if you tell your assistant or your wife, <laughs> whoever, hey, um, get in contact with – your attorney, get in contact with your vendor, uh, some vendor you have. Yep. Do you imagine that they're going to turn around, pick up the phone, call, and get them on, get that person on the phone? Yep. Yeah, not likely. <clears throat> no, they're probably going to email, text, leave a voicemail, yep. call, call a few times, and they are. What are they doing? They're getting in contact with right. that person. Yep. What do we tell salespeople or cold call or SDRs? What do we want them to do? Normally, what do we say? Uh, get the numbers up. Uh, make, make 100 calls. Yeah, make the dials. So call. Yep. So that's the goal is to make calls. Yep. Right? What are they going to come back with? Calls. The, yep. If you tell your, your assistant, do you want to her to call? Do you say, call the attorney? Maybe, but what you want to do is get in contact with the attorney. Yep. Good. Good. So then they, they have that one goal. Yep. Get in contact with the attorney. Yep. Call multiple times. Yep. So what we need to be telling salespeople is here's a list of, of 30, 40 names. Yep. Get in contact with all of them. I like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. That, that gave me an idea of, um, of how we would target. I'm working in a niche right now and I want um, to target a very select group and it's only, maybe a couple hundred companies across the country. So I've, my brain's been firing off uh, as, as we've been talking about this. It's, it's, it makes it so easy. I mean, mm -hmm. That's because it's like playing the lottery. It's like buying the lottery tickets. Do you yep. have a good chance if you buy one? Yep. If you buy 10,000 lottery tickets. Yep. The more times you try to do something, you increase your chances. Right. right? So, so the Cold Kong's a numbers game is like a buying one lottery ticket. Yep. To get into each one of these names, you try one time and then... Oh, I didn't get in touch with them. So let me ask you a question. Are you taking those 30 to 40 names, making those 90 to 120 dials per day? Is that your entire day? Or are you doing that with another group of 30? And doing well, no, that, that, see, that's the beauty of this. If you're really an SDR, then you would fill your day up with different lists. Right. Different buckets. Yep. Yep. I could be called, if I'm only calling attorneys today, then I may call the attorneys uh, in the morning <coughs> in Houston. Yep. In the afternoon, I may call in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. if I early, early, I may call the East Coast. Yep. Well, those three different buckets, I would work for a week. Got it. Then I would try to get a few more buckets the next week. Okay. I may come back around to that first bucket. Got it. And hit that again hard. Yeah. Uh, because what I found is is that, say for about six months, there's going to be people on on that list of say 200 or 150. There's going to be 20, 30 of those you can't get in contact at all. Right. But you get in contact with these other people eventually. But what often happens is that flips. The next six months, you may not get in contact with the people that you first talked to, but the other people, it's it's somehow like you ever gotten bogged down with yep. something yep. and you just can't pick your head up? Yep. 
this is just a group of people like that that are bogged down. They can't get their head up, but then they get a lot of that work done and then they're a little bit freer and then they take calls, you know, it's just so, all these weird things happening. Yeah. And then I think also just the law of um, 15% of a market's looking at any given time and 3% buying. And if you're doing this over the course of the year, those, those groups of people are going to be moving along that buying cycle throughout the course of the year as well. So that yeah, that's why you need to, you need to get, the beauty is you want to get these people early. Yep. And then build a relationship with them. Okay. That's the thing. And what I found from selling things that take a long time to sell is that you get them early before they actually have the need. Yep. Now, sometimes you can sell them right away. Yep. Uh, but other times you may have to build a relationship with them. And then if they do actually get the need at that, some point, right? <clears throat> Normally you can sell them without taking any other bids. In other words, that company doesn't look at anybody else. Right. That's the beauty of not trying to find need. When you're trying to find a need, you're always going to be bidding. It's always a bidding war. And you're always going to be up against probably price as an issue. Yep. When you catch people early, you can sell them, you build that relationship with them, and then they're really only going to buy from you. You're the one that taught them about the new thing, the cool thing, right? Right. If you do get into a bidding war, I found that these people will go out and they'll get the bids and they'll bring them back to me. It's my deal to lose. Right. Because I got them early and because I built a relationship with them. Right. Right. Does that right. make sense? Yeah, it does. Out of that, um, out of that, let's say you're an SDR and you're, you've got two blocks of, of 30 names that you're going to run through. So you got your morning block or let's say you've got your two blocks, your two lists, and you want to run through, let's say a hundred to 200 dials per day. A out of those two lists, how many appointments would you want to, would you expect to set out of that as a normal SDR? It totally depends on what you're selling. You know, for example, um, IT is one of the hardest things to set appointments for. Yep. Um, insurance, workers' comp quotes, a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. PEO services, a little bit different. Uh, copiers, a little bit harder. You, you see what I'm saying? Yep. It totally depends on what you're selling, um, number one. And then it would totally depend on your personal ability to be persuasive. You follow uh, what I'm saying? So, yep. Oh, what, the, what, each the, what each step does is understanding it's not a numbers game and then change, changing the way you dial yep. helps you get more con, get in contact with people. Right, right. Then it's how good are you going to be at getting past the gatekeeper? Got it. These are, you asked me a question. What were all the things I learned? Yep. <clears throat> that was, it was just step by step. Yep. How to get more dials and get in more contacts and get past the gatekeeper. How to engage with those people with the decision making and get them interested in talking to me. Right how to explain what I do and get them interested and create curiosity and be dramatic. Yep. Just go on and on and on. And then you get into your sales skill. So it's what you're selling. It's um, the market itself. So the, the, the city yep. could be different. So, you know, when, I, when we were doing credit cards, we hate to call Florida because in Florida, you had to make an announcement that you're calling about a credit card before you say anything. <laughs> gotcha. So our numbers went way down when we called Florida. Right. Does that make sense? So there's yeah, lots, of, there's lots of factors. So, sure. but if you understand the principles that it's not a numbers game, mm -hmm. that you can tell to people that don't have a need, those two things will dramatically increase the possibilities. And then if you can become more persuasive, because that's, because my book is really, uh, you've read how to win friends and influence people, right? Mm -hmm. It's a filter from that and a few other books into techniques for cold calling. Right. You know, you can, I don't know how much time we have, but um the most, the way to be persuasive and what goes into a lot of my objections is simply agreement and agreeing with people, which is out of how to win friends and influence people. Right. If, if you, when you get people on the phone, if it's just imagine this, when we're talking, if I could find a way to say something that you agree with two thirds of the time, every once in a while I say something you're like, I don't know about that, but two thirds of the time you're like, yeah, I, I can see that. I see your point. Yep. Yes, I agree. I agree. No, nah, I don't know. But yes, yes, I don't know. Yes, yes. If you could say things that people agree with and you start out a call saying things they agree with and you end the call saying things they agree with, what would you have? An overall yeah. positive conversation. Yeah. In other words, when I was starting this, I really had this crazy idea that I could probably set an appointment with nearly everybody I talked to. You have to have that belief. 
you can't. There's just always going to be a naysayer out there or somebody that will rock the boat or be nasty, have a bad attitude that day or whatever. But that is the thing. That is being persuasive. Now, how do you do that? How do you say yes and get them to say yes and do it all the way? Now, it's not like Boiler Room. You've probably seen that movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a clip in my my master class. If people go to – well, we'll talk about my book later, but I have a master class where I teach – some free secrets. Yep. Uh, I can give them my book for free. <clears throat> they get these free secrets they can learn. Uh, one of them is about this yes, yes principle. And I, and I have a clip from Boiler Room where the guy says, just get them to say yes. Get them to say yes to anything. If you're drowning and I throw you a, a life preserver, will you pick it up? Yes. Then buy 200 stocks for me today. I won't let you down. That is not what we're talking about. Right. We're talking about actually getting agreement. Ed, do you believe time is money? I do. Ed, do you think anything's possible? I do. Okay. This universe is so massive. It's unlimited. Is it possible that there's other life forms out there? I believe so. Is it possible that there's aliens? Definitely. Okay. So (laughs) basically, I could call and sell aliens if I wanted to. Right. But that's, that's how you do it. That's, and that's one of my secrets is I call that, um, what is it, if, if you, um, the reasonable doubt. If there's a reasonable doubt, then you must acquit, right? And you sell based on a reasonable doubt. You get somebody in that you build agreement with on some of these concepts, like time's money, stuff right. like that. And then you throw some things out there, like, is anything possible? You know, is it, is it possible that there's a better offer out there somewhere? Right. I mean, and you, and you do your, you do your reviews, right? When was the last time you did a review? Oh, we did it a few years ago. How many companies did you look at? Oh, we looked at three companies. Is it possible you didn't look at the best company? Right. <laughs> Stuff like that. So it's just that possibility. And then you can take that possibility and turn that into an appointment. Got it. So it's, it's super easy, but it's still based on what you're selling. It's still based on your market and all those things, but whatever you're doing, it'll be easier. Sure. <laughs> Everybody just take, for example, my, my chapter on qualifying, mm-hmm. just qualifying your list before you call. Okay. <clears throat> can help you double your contacts. Got it. Do you want to go through you know, that? What, what do you just, mean by qualifying? Just calling in and knowing that I've got to call Ed Stapleton. Yep. I trained a company called the 20 out in Plano mm-hmm. and I did all this advanced training for two weeks. And then we got them on the phone, got them on the phone and they were there for three to four hours. They never made one contact. And I looked at what they were calling and it was like wrong number out of area, bad number. That guy doesn't work here anymore. You know, it was like, right. if you call garbage, you could have the best salesman in the world and he's not going to get in contact with anybody. So if you can imagine just getting the list, just getting me 30 names and I know all the p- people that I'm going to call and it's all verified. Yep. That right there, you could go in any department and probably triple the numbers of appointments are setting just by doing that. So when you start adding all these things up, right. Qualified list, targeting a bigger market. Um, you don't do the numbers game. You get in contact with them. You learn how to get past gatekeepers. You learn how to arouse curiosity all those things. And that's the, really, it, it can make this a lot easier than people think it is. Sure. So it's just, a, it, it, again, it goes back to the compound effect. It's all these things compounding on each other to get to that 15 calls per day. You can take one or two secrets and improve. Uh, but then if you're not tapping into your subconscious mind, if you're not saying every morning that I'm going to set, this, I'm going to set five appointments a day or whatever your goal is. If you're not saying that every day, you're not tapping into your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind is what takes all those things Yep. And makes those habits. Yep. So that it, it comes off off your tongue just like, you know, just easy, quick, fast. You don't have to think about it. Right. That's when you're not thinking about it. That's when you're in the zone. When you're not worried about what you're going to say, you're not worried about all your objections. You've got them memorized and mastered. Right. And you pick that up with confidence. Mm-hmm. You feel part about confidence. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, what is it? What do people say? <laughs> everything it's uh, everything is uh it's not change everything is about attitude 
attitude is everything. And I tell people, no, it's everything is confidence. Selling is about confidence. Right. When you, when you have all that memorized and you're not worried about it and you pick that phone up with confidence, just the confidence alone. When I'm talking to a decision maker and I believe in what I'm selling and I'm confident about it, just that comes through and that could persuade the person to set up an appointment. Right. Very interesting. Um, talk to me about mirroring. Mirroring. I hear, I hear that a lot. I have a chapter in my, or a section of my book about it. Mm -hmm. You can mirror somebody just by repeating the last couple things they said. Right. Um, but you, I like to really mirroring for me comes when I'm talking, trying to get past gatekeepers. Got it. Okay. Because what I, what I found is that most people are negative. Mm -hmm. When you talk to executives, they tend to be a little bit more, they tend to have a little bit more positive outlook. Okay. <clears throat> so when you, when you, you're a salesman, you tend to be like pumping yourself up and be like Pollyanna and excited. And I'm going to get my numbers. We're going to get our numbers. Let me get this call. You know, right. you have all this excitement. You're calling somebody making minimum wage who lives for the weekend can't wait for five o'clock, not excited about their job. Right. That's the number one way people know that you're a salesman when you call. Yep. And I'll talk about that in the book. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways I like to mirror people is, is I call and I go negative and I'm like, okay, let me, let me pretend that I'm a person who gets paid by the hour, minimum wage. I don't make enough money. I live for the week. <laughs> Good morning. Hey, how's it going? Oh my God, I'm just barely waking up. Uh, I can't keep my eyes. Literally, you would not think of making calls like that, would you? No. But if you're talking to a receptionist or a screener, they will respond to that. But when they say hello, that hello tells me I go negative. That hello, how their, their tone, how long it takes, hello. <laughs> oh man, do you have a weekend? I'm barely working up here. I got to get my coffee. You know, you can literally talk like that and then be like, oh, hey, try edge line. Nope. Okay. <laughs> That's mirroring. Now mirroring when you're talking to decision makers is uh, their pitch, their tone. You know, they talk slow, talk slow. Right. The best way to mirror is they, they talk and it's more of, that's why it's not more mirroring. It's more understanding. Got the it. Seven habits of highly effective people. Mm-hmm. I could mirror you. It works more with a gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. But if I can understand you, if I can let you know that I get you, Ed, I get your challenges. I get you don't like salespeople. I understand that they've wasted your time. I understand they've harassed you. After they contacted you, they kept calling you for months. And it's like, why do I want to start that and then have all that negative consequence, right? Yep. I get that. But I'll tell you what, I promise. If you give us a chance, our guy's not a salesman. He's not going to try to sell you. He's not pushy, no pressure. He's not going to call you a thousand times. Would you give us a chance? But the key there is that my understanding of you and your, your, your issue with salespeople, right? Yep. Whatever that is, if I can understand it and I can let you know I understand it, um, it's in the seven habits of highly effective people. People actually flip. If, if I can just make a call and, and get into a conversation, explain what we have to offer, you're going to start to object a little bit. Not, not, it, it's actually buying objections. It's a buying sign, not an objection, because they start thinking about how this would work in their company, right? And those come out in kind of like objections, but they're not objections because they're still talking to you. Mm -hmm. That's when you want to listen to those things and, and start projecting or mirroring or understanding. Listening and writing in what they're saying down and repeating it back would be the mirroring aspect. You write it down, you know, I write, oh, wow, okay, he has an issue with uh, long-term agreements, uh, pressure, boom, 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 boom. You write all those things down. Then you start telling them back, uh, agreeing with him, right? And then going, what I call it is, is uh, overly agreeing with them. I, it's aggressively agreeing with them. Right. It's like, not only do I agree with you, but let's start a club, man. <laughs> Got it. Let's start a movement. Right. Let's start a movement against salespeople. I am down. 
you know, and what happens is, and you, I don't know, are you married? I am. Yep. I see this on TV all the time and sometimes I'm smart enough <laughs> to use it. It's hard in the moment of a, a fight or a battle to, to use this technique. But when you agree with somebody, it ends debate. When you try to understand them, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and like, it's, it's, it's really my fault. I caused this whole thing and I was stupid. I said some stupid things. What happens is, the other person will flip and they'll try to understand you. Mm -hmm. No, honey, no, it's not all your fault. And they could have just been calling you a SOB and all this, you know, like as soon as you lose or agree, and I'm quitting the argument, you win. And it works, it works like a charm. It's, it's the most powerful thing you can do on a call is to not only listen, mirror, say back what they said, but then really empathize with them. Got it. Really let them know. After that, people would almost lay down. Got it. I mean, what is a 30, 40 minute meeting, you know, to learn about something? Right. Right. It's nothing. Right. And we're not going to sell you. We're just going to present our right. thing. You know, most com- you know, like most companies can't sell you on the meeting. Yep. It's just an introductory meeting. Yep. <clears throat> they're not going to pull out a contract and say, sign here. Right. So as long as they're not doing that, it's really just, you can always ghost us if you want. Right. Right. <laughs> it's true. But that is, that is the most powerful thing. But you have to, like you say, you have to do all the steps, get to that. And then I won't talk about the million dollar rebuttal, but the million dollar rebuttal was, well, what time is it? Yeah, I got, we got time. Um, essentially what happened is I used that system and progressively implemented more and more of it until I finally got almost, a hundred percent. I was like 90% of the system working. Mm-hmm. It was a two week period at CSI where I was, I was getting 40 contacts a day. Um, I was talking literally to the decision makers on every one of those calls, getting them through the pitch, getting them all the way to the close and asking for a close. Yep. 40 times a day. And then uh, being told send information on every call, send information, send information, send information, send information, every, every call was send information, which is unusual because sometimes you get a not interested. Yep. Sometimes you get call me back, right? Sometimes yep. you get all these different objections, but I only got send information. And I remember, and it's in, the, I don't know if you read that in the book, yep. I got frustrated and I, <clears throat> because I felt like I was almost to getting the 15 appointments a day. Right. But then I went into this two weeks of no appointments. It's like, I went backwards. Mm-hmm. We stopped when we talk about failure, I started failing bigger. Yep. That I never failed before, but I, but I was so close to actually winning. Yep. Right. It's that, what is that? Three feet from gold. Mm-hmm. Right. It was, I was literally three feet from gold, but if I had stopped and given up, then I, I wouldn't be here with you. I wouldn't have written the book. None of these things would happen. Right. Uh, I wouldn't have bought the land and built the house and helped my parents out. And none of that would happen. Right. But I threw my, my headset and went outside and I still smoked at that time. And I was, <sighs> and then I was like, wait a minute. Everybody I'm calling is saying the same objection. That's actually that's a good thing. Unbelievable. Yeah. That's power. That's like playing chess with somebody who always opens the same way. Right. You know, they always go to the middle game. They, you know, they close this, they have the end game the same. And I play them over and over and over again. And it's almost like um, what's that movie? Uh Groundhog Day. Yep. He had to live the same day over and over again, right? Mm-hmm. Well, he got to perfect his his approach to that woman. <laughs> she slapped him, she kicked him, she you know, and then finally she was nice to him, you know. And then he tried again, and he tried again, and he tried again. Well, that's what it's like when when you can have a a presentation that pushes everybody to one objection. Then all you have to do is come up with the most powerful, sent information objection, and spend all of your time thinking about every angle that somebody could come from and looking at it from their perspective. Um, all, putting all the principles into that one objection and then pow, just like magic. Once I did that, I started using that, that send information. I call that the million dollar rebuttal yep. and then boom, appointment, 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 appointment. That was the final key. And then I rode off into the sunset. You know, I, I did all that. And then later I started my own company and ran a call center for 13 years, helping companies like Sata Systems make millions of dollars cold calling all the while Everyone was saying, cold calling's dead. 
Cold calling's dead. I took three trips to Hawaii. I went on cruises. Uh, we went to Disney World. We went all over the place. And everybody, I'd be like, cold calling paid for all this. <laughs> everybody says it's dead, but it's not. Yep, I it's agree. Still, I mean, we, we grew, we grew our, our second agency all with cold calling. So this all resonates very much for me. And I can't wait to uh, start recrafting our, our messaging for this and attack the market in a different way using the techniques we've, we've learned today. Um, if, if you had to look at the, uh, let's call it 15 steps to get to 15 appointments a day, you know, what you've learned along the way, the steps up the ladder, what would you say is the most important lesson you learned to get to that point? The most important one is, is that one about agreeing with people? Mm -hmm. Cause that was the key that finally, cause what happens is salespeople mainly argue with prospects all day long. Yep. They don't understand it. They don't yep. know that they are. Yep. And it wasn't until I read that and you, I had to meditate on it every day, every day, meditate on it. Cause what I realized was my first awakening was I'm reading and in, in how to win friends and influence people says you can never win an argument. And I believe that I don't think I'm arguing. So I was in denial when they asked for information. I didn't want to send it to them because I wasn't going to get an appointment. Right. And I didn't get paid unless I got an appointment. Right. Right. And that's how most salespeople are. Yep. They don't want to send the information. Right. They're probably not going to read it. And if I call back, I'm just going to be calling back in this endless loop. Did you get the information? Right. <clears throat> but when I tell, when I, whatever, whatever I said. Real, real, real quick. Don't tell me what that is because I want people to actually get this book and I want them to actually read it. <laughs> okay. So don't give the answer. I, I know what the answer is because I read the book, but okay. don't, don't actually give it because there's way more value in this book than just getting that one single answer. That's not the answer. The answer is not in just that one answer. There's, there's more that goes into it. So purposely leaving that out. And also uh, I have the training videos I've created uh, that people can get, but I, you can get the book for free at getbookoffer.com. Uh, just, I bought a copy for everybody. Just tell me where to send it and I'll send you a free copy. Just pay for shipping and handling. And then there's all these other, I've got workbooks that people can get for free. I've got a master class. Have you heard of Jeremy McGillery? I have not, no. He's a genius at Instagram. Okay. And he sat down with me in the studio and we talked about the subconscious mind. He has a book out called CEO, which is all about the subconscious mind. Okay. So we talk about that. That's a masterclass. People can get that for free. Uh, so all this stuff you can get for free. And then um, the idea is that you want to join that masterclass where I'm going to teach three of these most powerful principles for free, but I'm going to teach them. I'm going to go into deep with illustrations and video clips and all this stuff and make nice. it fun. I'll, um, well, we'll talk after, after sure. the show. Cool. But yeah, you can get it on Amazon. Get my book on Amazon. Awesome. But if you want to get it for free, then get bookoffer.com. Get bookoffer.com. Okay. Um, final four questions. Um, I think I already know the answer to this, but um, what's your favorite book of all time? My favorite book all the time. My number one favorite would be How to Win Friends and Influence People. Right. Um, my second one would be Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Got it. I kind of picked up on that. that. That changed my life. <laughs> right. Um, last book you read? The last book I read was Traffic Secrets. Got it. Russell Brunson. Okay. Traffic Secrets. I just did a video review on that one. Nice. Um, what is the best advice you've ever gotten and who gave it to you? The best advice I ever got? Uh, lately, my the best advice was from Jeremy, who's coaching me now. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you want to make any money on a podcast, you have to have a very short domain that you can give people over the radio that they can remember and write down. Got it. I, like I had that. done a lot of podcasts yep. and he said, what's your domain? He was like, what's your domain? And I was like, uh, it's million dollar rebuttal.com backslash free hyphen slash book slash <laughs> this slash this slash. Right. He's like, they're not going to, nobody's going to write that down. They're not going to remember it. They're not going to buy from it. He said, so you have to, I now I couldn't find free because all the ones that were related to free, Mm -hmm. or like $10,000 domains that they wanted to buy. Um, but get book offer, I thought was pretty simple. Yeah. I like that. Get book offer.com. Quick. I mean, and if fun. it was a free book, that'd be better. But so maybe when it, once, that once works. I, once it starts rocking and rolling, I'll go back and get the get free book. Forget that. I said that. Don't, <laughs> don't remember that. Nice. Do not remember that. <laughs> uh, last question. Um, if you could go back and talk to your 20 year old self, what advice would you give yourself? Oh man, I would have wrote this book. I would have wrote this because see, 
that's the the problem is that everybody should write a book. Mm -hmm. And what happens is when I start thinking about this book and other books that I want to write, you know, what we always say, we always say, Oh, somebody's already written a book about that. Mm -hmm. Og Mandino, Jeb Blunt read a good book. Mark Hunter already wrote a good book about following. Yep. following. Why would I write a book about it? Hey, you know, I agree, man. And I, and I, I, I was hesitant to buy this at first because I've had, I don't know, uh, three people on the channel already that talk specifically about cold calling, but you've got a very different approach and, and I like it and definitely resonate. That's why I picked up the phone to call you. I, I'm glad you did this because there, there's Thank a you. lot of value in this book. And I, I really think me, it was the biggest this. thing I've ever done. I mean, it's a five year project. Yeah. So it was huge. Um, but I did all this stuff almost 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. When I did 15 appointments a day, and I left and all, all I was worried about is making money. I didn't realize that I had revolutionized the concept of cold call. Yep. And so we all have a story. We all have a story to tell, but, but even then, let's say I just wrote a book about the subconscious mind, which is part of this, right? Anthony, Anthony uh, Robbins already wrote the best book on that. Yep. You know, um, these other people already read them, but, but what it is, it's not, it's people won't learn from one book. They can't learn from one book. Just like marketing, you have to hit people seven times. Yep. Or actually 77 times, right? Yep. I read one book. I read another book. I read, you keep reading books. And when you hear the same point, like you may not everything, but this guy said this, and this guy said the same thing, and this guy said the same thing. <clears throat> what you have is the different stories. So it's your story, right? Yep. At some point, at some point, if I keep reading books about the subconscious mind, I'll become convinced or get enough belief to take action. And so we need more stories out there. We need more stories, more perspectives, so that people can read it about the subconscious mind. They can read it about um, um, the idea of forgiveness, um, the idea from good to great, that you have to look for people who are committed to your goals in your company or get rid of them, fire them. Mm -hmm. People haven't read that enough, right? All these things, people have read these things, but they haven't read enough because, I, I mean, I don't know about you, but in most of the businesses that I've seen that they don't, they're not applying the things that they are reading. Yeah. I, um, I read a lot. I would say I don't, I, I don't apply enough of what I read. Um, I try to as best I possibly can. You know, I think in every book, there's a, at least one golden nugget to pull out of it. Um, that's how I try to go into books um, and, and just pull one good thing out of it uh, and then try to apply it as best I possibly can. Um, applying something is good. Yeah. Uh, but I, most people I find don't apply anything. Yeah, you're right. In fact, the more books they read, I find the less they apply. Yeah, yeah, did that. There's definitely a difference between kicking tires and the shiny object syndrome and the application of it. Um, but I definitely agree with you when when you talk about stringing ideas together from book to book to book. Like I read, um, if you go to like Stephen Schiffman's uh, cold calling book, and then the Scott channel cold calling books. And then, and, and I just kept bouncing from idea to idea. You know, I got, it got ingrained in my head early on that cold calling was a, a brutal bitch of a job and it just sucked. And I was just not trained well and I wasn't very good at it. So that was my, my notion of it. And I just didn't, didn't think it would work, but then I just kept saying, okay, it works for other people. I could get it to work for us, uh, for us. So I just kept looking for solutions and, you know, just kept fine tuning it along the way. So yeah, I, I'm a big believer in, um, you know, stringing ideas together. Again, I guess it goes back to the compound effect, you know, failing. But you also see that just like in culture, you know, you see this culture believed in, you know, they had some code and the code was don't cheat on your wife. Yep. Don't steal, you know, and then you see this culture, you know, had that in this one and you're like, okay, this is fundamental. This is something that I should pay attention to. Yep. That's yep. what I look for. I look for messages that repeat over and over again. And the more I see the message, the more I say, you know, Mahatma Gandhi talked about this. Yep. Jesus Christ talked about it. This this guru talked about it. You know, this person talked about it. Something there. Right. Right. Awesome. One more time. How do they get the book? Where do they go? Uh, if you want a free copy of the book, it's getbookoffer.com. Okay. And um, now it, it's also on Amazon. Um, but with my offer, there's different offers where you can get the audiobook offer for free. So really it's, it's all, I, I'll just direct everybody to get book offer.com. Awesome. Uh, you put your address in there and uh, pay for shipping handling. And then boom, you're going to have not just only the book, but you're going to have masterclass. Um, you're going to have um, the ebook and a lot of different stuff that you get automatically.
Cool. Thank you very much, David. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, Ed. Thank you. I'm glad you reached out to me. Absolutely. It's been Good great. Good luck, and uh, we'll be in contact, hopefully. Thank you.